patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. You've heard this thousands of times. Thousands of times. In verse 16, it mentions here that how do we overcome the desires of the flesh? How do we overcome? That's what we are fighting all the time. Our temptations, our inner demons, the baggage, the things that we don't tell anybody. And one thing is clear. Paul is telling the Galatian church, if you guys want to overcome, if you really want to become close with Christ, it is not done by your own effort. It is done by the Spirit of Christ. That's why it says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. It doesn't say, let Eunice drive her own life and lead her own life. It doesn't say, Peter, so I say, walk by Peter, walk by my own intellect or my own effort or energy, but it says, walk by the Spirit. It says, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. The Greek word, the form of the Greek verb translated here is par peripateo. And par peripateo means to walk, right? And it's in the present continuous. It's in the present tense, which means if you learn Greek one, right, all the verbs, basically, you learn them in the continuous sense, in the continuous form. And this is what this form is here. And what this means is, when it says, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, walk by the Spirit, it is a continuous action. It is a habitual lifestyle. It's not a one-time deal, but it's an ongoing action. Ongoing action. It is not by our might, nor by our power, we achieve this ongoing action. It's kind of like candle pin bowling. Ray, we went there uh, Friday night, and what, what's, what, what did you realize about candle pin bowling? <laughs> Why is it for kids? It was it easy? That's not what you said. Oh, you did regular than your regular bowling? But is it? The ball, the balls are small, and the candle pin, candle pin. This was actually my first time candle pin bowling in my whole life, all right. And I thought it was pretty cool. It is not a power game. It is not a power game. It is a what? It's a finesse game. So even my little boy did better than me, and the and the sixth graders did better than me because it's not about power, but it's about finesse, right? Finesse? Finesse is um, kind of with your skill, like touch, right? Right? So it's not about like, let me give you an example. You guys know Shaquille O'Neal? Shaquille O'Neal! Sha Shaq is known for what? Dunking. It's all about power. But look at Steph Curry. What's Steph Curry all about? He's about, he's about skill, ball handling. He's very smooth. When he makes layups... He can kind of throw it high off the glass because he has the right touch, the right angle. And that's the candle pin bowling. You don't just like throw it like a bowling ball, but you have to kind of throw it smoothly. That's what we're talking about. Yes. I mean, and that's the other thing. The sixth graders can do well because why? Are they strong as Ray? No, they're not strong as Ray, right? That's why the, the youngsters can, can play as well. So the reason why I'm kind of talking about this candle pin bowling is then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. How do we defeat, how do we overcome this sinful nature of ours? It is not by our power, but it's by the Holy Spirit, right? We have to... We, we, we are always used to trying to work hard, right? Work hard for everything. If you work hard, then you're going to achieve something. But when it comes to the sinful nature, no matter how hard you work, you're never going to overcome. You're never going to overcome with your own strength. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to come and heal your hearts. You have to allow the Holy Spirit come to allow the Holy, Holy Spirit to come and 
help you deal with your sinful nature. It is not us trying to be really patient and pulling all this, this, sh- this effort into, oh, not sinning. It is us believing that this power is not from us, but from the Holy Spirit. We must fully be convinced that the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us, and he is fighting for us. And it is not of our doing, but the Spirit's doing. In verse 17, the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of this, the sinful nature desire. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. This battle, we talked about in our small group last Sunday, right? And we said, we said this, there's an angel. You guys know like in the movies, there's an angel on one side of the shoulder and there is? Right, devil on the other side, and who's going to win? Devil. <laughs> what? Right? Like yes. Like... Good versus evil. Who's going to win in the, at the end of the movie? Good. Good. That's, the, that's, that's how we, you know, um, we're accustomed to, right? We know good versus evil all the time. And we, and we know in the end, good is going to overcome evil. And so we talked about this in our small groups, right? And I, I kind of um, thought about there are two dogs in our, inside of us. If you go to Korea, what's, the, high, what's the, the, the most expensive dog, the Korean dog? Jindokke, right? Jindokke is our, the top breeds in Korea. And then what's the, the lowest breed? We call it, we call it Donke, right? <laughs> We call it a mutt, right? D D O N G K, okay? Donke, uh, a mutt, a mixed. So you have a donke and you have a chindoke, right? Who's going to win? Donke. <laughs> right? We have these two dogs fighting inside of us. Which one will win? The one you feed the most. The one that you feed the most. So if you keep feeding, the donke, and you don't give the pop to the jindoke, the, jindo, the donke is going to win. Right? And if, if you keep... <laughs> all right. Bad idea of using this example, but... The dog that you feed the most is going to win, right? Because he's going to have the most energy. And that's the same thing with our spiritual life. If you're feeding the demon more and more, you're going to fall into your sinful nature. But if you're feeding the angel, right, then you're going to win this battle. And what does this feeding mean? The flesh and the spirit are always fighting, right? They're always fighting each other. And their power and their influence determine the direction of your life. As a result, you cannot do what you want to do, but you do what the flesh wants or the Holy Spirit wants. So my, my encouragement to you or um, kind of what I want to say here is when you, when you are obedient to Christ and you're surrendering, you're submitting yourself unto Christ, you're submitting unto God's authority and you're, and you're, you're being honest and sincere with the Lord and saying, Lord, I give up. I cannot, fight, I cannot defeat this demon. No matter how hard I try, I'm always, I'm always failing. And I don't know about you guys, but I've been in that situation, situation a lot of times. Right? One week I'm doing well. Next week, boom. One week I'm doing well. Next week, I'm depressed. Right? And it's just, just kind of this roller coaster because I'm trying to live out my faith with my own strength. As long as I'm reading QT and going to Bible and prayer meeting and I'm doing, I'm checking all the lists, that means I'm spiritual, right? But inside, there's still that war going on. In verse 18, but when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. You see, um, you're, we are not forced to obey the law, right? 
and and the law we're talking about is the law of Moses, which is the Ten Commandments. We're no longer under the the first covenant, the blessings and the cursings of the law, right? The reason people create idols is so that they can control the idols, right? When, when Moses was on top of the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, the Israelites and Aaron were at the bottom of the mountain. They were getting very impatient. So what they request something of Aaron. They say, oh, man, we're waiting, we're waiting. And what do they ask Aaron? To, what, what, what do they say? Does anyone remember? Anybody? What does what what do the Israelites say to Aaron? Make me, yeah, make me an idol. So Aaron says, take off your gold rings and your gold earrings and everything, and then he makes them an idol. And the point of this idol, guys, is not they really want to worship God, right? But these idols are for their own pleasure, right? They're saying, oh, this idol is like a god, but can this idol talk? No, it is mute. The reason why it's mute is the Israelites, they get to choose. Okay, here's my God. But then the idol can't do anything, can't say anything. So whenever they don't want to worship it no longer, they just get, you know, they just ignore it. And then what happens? They become their own gods. And that's what idols are in our lives. And that's why our, our fleshly nature, we want to create idols. Because why? We want to become our own gods. We don't want to give up our rights. We don't want to give up our achievements and accolades and our own comfort. So I encourage you guys, if you, if you live by the Holy Spirit and you allow the Holy Spirit to, to control you, you will learn, ah, God will make you realize right, how to give up these idols. So think about what are your idols in your life? Right? Because with these idols, the Holy Spirit cannot come to, to take control. In verse 20, not, uh, verse 19, verses 19 through 21, it talks about all the sinful desires. What does it say? It says, when you follow the, desi the, the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, right? Um, Hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, um, ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will, will inherit or will not. This one word makes the whole difference. Will inherit or will not inherit. Ryan, what does it say? Will not. Make that very clear, guys. If you're living by the sinful nature and you are living for this, you're allowing that sinful nature to just control and dictate your life, I didn't say it. Will didn't say it. Ryan didn't say it. Apostle Paul says, let me tell you again. Let me tell you again. He's reiterating. He's emphasizing as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Wild living, living like party animals, right? Idolatry, which means basically worshiping anything apart from the one true God. And we can go on and on about the sinful nature. The verse... Verses 22 through 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. And we have. So one thing I want to point out to you guys is here, when it talks about the works of the sinful nature, all right? Here it says, follow, when you follow the, de the desires, it's plural or singular? It's, it's plural. But think about this. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of plural or singular? Well, look at all the fruit. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. More than one. But why is this singular? Okay. It is singular because the fruit, the fruit that Paul's talking about is not your fruit. It's not the the humanly fruit of love, joy, peace. Yes, the whole world loves love, joy, but who doesn't love these things? All the world thinks these are great qualities, but we're talking about a different kind of uh, fruit here. The fruit here is the multifaceted character of one person. These are all fruits of who? Yeah, do you want? Yes, God, Jesus Christ. This is Paul who's, Paul's pointing to the fruit of Christ. He's telling us to be like Christ because all of these qualities are of Christ. These are his qualities. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. The image that we need to think about is the vine and the branches. It describes the fruit of the Spirit as being like a cluster of grapes. Right? There's a single stem, right, attached to a vine from which a cluster grows. Right? So you have this, the vine, right? And then what do you guys have off the vine? You have the grapes. Have you ever seen a have you ever seen something like this before? Have you seen grapes this humongous and then small grapes like this? No, usually it doesn't work like that. Right? Grapes are usually the same size when they're going out, and this is what it means by the fruit of the spirit. When one fruit, when you are bearing one of these fruits, they're all growing together. Because it's all from the same source. Right? If you think you can just grow love. Okay, I'm a good person with love. And then all of these, you're impatient. You're, you know, you got, a, you got a, you know, some kind of maybe a, a anger management problem. I don't know. That's the, the, wor the way the, worldly wor the world thinks. But in Christ, when one grows, all of the fruit grows together. Because we're all connected to the vine. We're all connected to Christ. That's why we cannot do it with our own power. When we're under the, the, the influence and the anointing of the Spirit, all of it grows. Because Christ, these are all his qualities that he has placed in you through the Holy Spirit. And we have to, we have to believe that. If we don't believe that, then we're not, we're not going to be able to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Each grape in the cluster is a characteristic of Jesus. When one grape grows, they all grow together. And that's when you have a healthy, luscious grape fruit, right? The, the grapes, they're all, right, um, delicious and juicy in the same size. And that's what God is um, desiring from us. Not this kind of fruit where one is humongous and, the one, and all the other ones are tiny. Kulus harikoyo. When you go to Market Basket, are you going to buy this cluster of grapes? No, you're going to buy the nice grapes that are all kind of same size and juicy and colorful, right, and delicious. And that's what God desires from us. But he's telling us that it's not done by our power. So let's go over these quick qualities together, and we will wrap up. First one is love. What is it? What did Jesus say the true mark of a disciple is? If you are my disciple, what did Jesus say to do? If you really love me, do what? Okay, leave all your belongings. And what, what else does he say? He says a true mark of, of, of a disciple is to love one another. That is a true mark, right? And Betsy, it's easy to love people who love me back, right? If I'm cool with you, you're probably going to be cool with me, but is it easy to love someone who murdered one of your family members? Woo! Hold up! <laughs> no, right? If you guys know Jim Elliott, remember I showed you guys the missionary who went to the, uh, South America to, the, to one of the tribal um, people there? What happened to him? They speared him. He went... And they killed him and four of his friends. But then what did his wife and his daughter do? Elizabeth. Not only forgive, but what did she do? She goes back to the tribal people and she spends her whole life 
not her whole life, but many years with them, raising her daughters with the tribal people who, who speared her husband to death. That's love. That's love. That's the love that Jesus is talking about. The love that Jesus, he didn't do anything wrong, but he got spat at. He was whipped to the point of death, crowned. He didn't do anything wrong, but he gave his life. The agape love, the unconditional love. That's the love that we're talking about, that Paul's talking about here. And we need to, again, we cannot love like that, right, Betsy? Can you love someone who maybe unintentionally, manslaughter, in a car wreck, one of your parent, one of your close ones died? Is it easy to love that person and forgive that person? Oh, yeah, it's very hard, right? Right? We can't even imagine that, right? We don't even know how we would react, right? But we need to think about it seriously. Where is that? Because the reason why Bessie says no and the reason why I say no is because it's my love. Yeah. If someone, I, I got in a car accident and, and, and one of my sons passes away, man, whoever was in that other car who hit me, man, I, I, there's no pastor in front of my name anymore. That's my, that's my love that I have. That's how limited my love is. Right, guys? That's how limited our love is. We need to keep praying. We need to keep asking our Holy Spirit, fill me with your love. Fill me with your love because we cannot do it with our love. Joy. What's the difference between joy and happiness? Hmm? I'm happy because I'm happy. Uh, I don't know how to sing that song, but you guys know what I'm talking no, not that one. The one by for real, right? Happy, cap your hands. Anyhow, what's the difference between joy and happiness? Ryan, what's the, uh, how many? Oh, joy is joy and happiness, right? <laughs> yes. You see, happiness, happiness has to do with everything going my way, right? Whereas joy can coexist with suffering and grief. Joy is, is rooted, it's stable, and it's grounded because we know how the story will end, right? So joy, no one can take away from you. Happiness, people can take away if they make, you know, they get on your nerves, right? And, you're not, and, you, and things are not going well, then you're unhappy. But joy is something much deeper that Paul is talking about here. Joy is even when you're in the concentration camp, even when you are going through hardships or hard times, right, there's this joy that no one can steal, even in your, um, in your most darkest moments. And that only comes from the Spirit. Peace. We say shalom today. This is the shalom that uh, we, we greeted one another with, the shalom, the peace. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And this shalom is not so much the absence of war, but the presence of a benevolent, just, and honorable king. Shalom reigned in the land of Israel when the people knew that their sovereign king was a man of character. So how can we have this peace? When our households, when the head of our households, when our families and the head of our families is a man of noble character, then there will be peace in your home. And, I'm, I, and I struggle with that every day, too, with that every day. Raising two boys, right? There's a lot of times, we call it in Korean, tukong yolyo. The pop tong tukong yolyo. You know what I mean. And that's what I do a lot, you know, more than I can count. And I regret. That is not a man of noble character, and I have to repent. If we want peace in the home, Right? If we want peace in the home, we have to allow Holy Spirit to, to heal us, to minister unto us. Patience, long suffering. Who had patience? Think about the prodigal, prodigal son's father. Right? The prodigal son, he just abandoned his father. What, did the father disown his, the son? The, son the, the father was patient and long suffering. He could have easily punished his son. But what does he do instead? He's patient and he allows his son to return, return with open arms. 
We need this patience. We need to be slow to anger. Kindness. You see, uh, Jesus knew when to stand up against the, the religious sects, uh, the Pharisees. And he knew when to be kind to the vulnerable and the weak. He allowed the children, the sick, the blind, and the handicapped, the women in adultery, caught in adultery, to come to him. Not only did he allow them to come to him, but he heals them. All right? Think about it, guys. When we're walking down and there's like a beggar, a homeless guy, right? What do we try to do? You try to avoid. You're like, oh. Right? And, that's, and that's, that's what the crowd did. When Jesus was like out in the, in the ministry, right? There was like handicapped people, people with diseases. They're like, get them away. We're, we're important. We got we to gotta hear Jesus talk. And what does Jesus do? Yeah, get them away from me, man. <laughs> get them away. Can't ruin my, my Versace and my, you know, nice gear and my kicks. Get, get them away. Is that what Jesus says? Yeah. Yeah. Thank God Jesus doesn't say that. Then we'll live in a really dog-eat-dog -dog world, right? It'll be such an ugly world. Jesus, Jesus says he stops everything he does. Think about that. For the woman caught in adultery, for the, the, the handicapped, the woman who was bleeding for 12 years, right? He stops. And not only does he stop, he says, let them come to me. That's the kindness we're talking about here. So again, these qualities are not in our human nature, guys. They're of the spirit. We need to continue to realize and surrender ourselves. The goodness here that Paul's talking about, what is goodness? Okay, and The goodness here is similar to the kindness. We need a generous heart, an open heart to help those who are hurting. Christians... Um, I remember Tim Keller, Pastor Tim Keller, came to our school last year's convocation, like the opening of this time, actually. I think, was it six months ago or something like that? And that's what he said. And one of the things that struck me is just saying, Christians need to be the most generous people on this earth, right? But our, us Christians, we're in our kind of religious clubs, right? Kind of like country clubs. And we kind of just, we're exclusive. We're not really being uh, missional which means going out and really and, and, um, touching the hearts, right, of those who are hurting in society and being good. Faithfulness here, okay? All right, we got three more. We're almost done. Faithfulness is keeping our promises, right? Let our yes be a yes and our no be a no. That's what it says in Matthew chapter 5, right, verse 37. So let's be a man of our word, a woman of, of, our, of, our, of our word, women of dignity and men of, uh, um, of integrity. Gentleness, gentleness is talking about, you guys know Moses. Moses was considered um, a very humble and meek man, but meek doesn't mean you're weak, right? Because if you think about Moses, what did Moses do? He led the Israelite, Israelites out of Egypt under the, full, under the rule of Pharaoh. Right? One of the most, the, the, the powerful, the most powerful king. And Moses takes him out. He leads them. So the gentleness we're talking about is submission to the Lord. Submission to the Lord. Having this type of, of, uh, of gentleness. Right? Even though we have the power, we are humble knowing that our power is limited. And God has given us that power in the first place. Last one is self-control. Not allowing our passions to run wild, right? You should not, um, knowing how to harness our passions in the direction God would have them go. It's like this. It's like an orchestra. And I know um, Sam's part of an orchestra. And there's many um, instruments with powerful players, right? And let's just say Sam, in his, in his uh, concert, he just starts going off on his own. Right? Right? He's the loudest. He's drowning out all the other instruments. Is it going to sound good or bad? Yeah. Right? If one player is overplaying and drowning out all the other instruments, that ruins the symphony. Right? Betsy knows as well. We have all these, and then Betsy just off on her own world. People will be like, Betsy, come on. 
get in sync with us, right? The same thing with our passions, right? Our passion, right? Our, we have many drives in us, right? We have, um, we have anger, right? Right? Um, we have these powerful drives, these powerful passions, but we have to know how to harness it, right? Our, our anger is not necessarily an evil thing. God in the Bible gets angry, but does he just let it unleash and just, just has no mercy and just kills everybody? No. So anger is not a bad thing, but when you let it, con let it get out of control, that's when it becomes bad. So Paul is saying we have to know how to harness these, um, these passions. And uh, Martin Luther, he says this. He says, we cannot help it if birds fly over our heads. It is another thing if we invite them to build nests in our hair. So self-control is keeping the birds out of our hair. As I've mentioned before, these qualities describe our Lord. And if the Holy Spirit lives within us, then these are the qualities that will emerge from us as we abide in Christ. We live in a society today, right, where we're trying to do everything on our own. DIY. What does DIY stand for? Or DIY. Do it yourself. Do it yourself, right? We have these self-help books, right, or self-improvement. Just figure it out on your own right we may think that we can grow the spirit of the uh, we can grow the fruit of the spirit through sheer willpower and our own effort but this is going to be artificial fruit our christian life is a battle and and a marathon and we cannot win this marathon this battle with our own efforts we must submit ourselves under the power of god and when we realize that we are nothing without god and apart from him we can do nothing when we realize that we cannot change ourselves, then Christ can come to soften our hearts and to change our qualities, to be his qualities. A lot of times, we can't see ourselves grow, right? Right? Um, like Ray and, um, Ray and Harry probably can't really tell if, if uh, Ryan is growing. Can you tell if he's growing? No, because they see each other every day. But then, when I see Ryan, I can see, because I haven't seen him in a long time. I see they both got these uh, George Clooney haircuts, and uh, they're all studs today, right? And I can see Ryan's much bigger than he was last year. Ray and Ryan, right? they cannot notice that because they live with each other every day. But I can see Ryan growing in Christ. I can see him right, growing physically, spiritually. Maybe not mentally, but um, no, I'm just kidding. It's just a joke, guys. Now you laugh. Yeah, my humor is really bad, right? But I see the love of Christ growing in Ryan, right, when we have small groups. Ryan cannot see it. Ray and Harry cannot see it. But the brothers and sisters in Christ, the ones that we are working together with, we can recognize if you have not grown or not. And I've seen all you guys throughout the year, right, growing Christ. Maybe you might not see it right now, but little by little, there is growth. There is change. That is the fruit of the Spirit. That is the power and the working of the Holy Spirit. So I, I just encourage you guys, don't, let's, let's not like, oh, I cannot, I cannot, you know, defeat the sinful nature. Yes, it's not you. It's God's already defeated through his son, Jesus Christ. He's already given us the victory. So as we come together and we encourage one another, we pray and we continue to live according to the word of God, God will do it and he will change us forevermore.